The scripture reading this morning is from the book of Ruth, chapter 3, beginning at the first verse. If you wish to follow along in the Pew Bible, it can be found on page 231 in the Old Testament. Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, I need to seek some security for you, so that it may be well with you. Now here is our kinsman, Boaz, with whose young women you have been working. See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Now wash and anoint yourself and put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, observe the place where he lies, then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. She said to her, all that you tell me, I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had instructed her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and he was in a contented mood, he went to lie down at the end of a heap of grain. Then she came stealthily and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over, and there, lying at his feet, was a woman. He said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your cloak over your servant, for you are next of kin. He said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. This last instance of your loyalty is better than the first. You have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not be afraid. I will do for you all that you ask, for all the assembly of my people know that you are a worthy woman. But now, though it is true that I am a near kinsman, there is another kinsman more closely related than I. Remain this night, and in the morning, if he will act as next of kin for you, good, let him do it. If he is not willing to act as next of kin for you, then as the Lord lives, I will act as next of kin for you. Lie down until the morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before one person could recognize another. For he said, it must not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. Then he said, Bring the cloak you are wearing and hold it out. So she held it and he measured out six measures of barley and put it on her back. Then he went into the city. She came to her mother-in-law who said, How did things go with you, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, he gave me these six measures of barley, for he said, Do not go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. She replied, Wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest, but will settle this matter today. Holy words for God's people. Thank you. Let's continue in prayer. Holy One, whatever it is that I may say in these minutes, may it be your word that we hear. For when you speak, we know who we are and what we are to do. Amen. We are in the third of a four-week series on the story of Naomi, her daughter-in-law Ruth, and their kinsman, we don't know how close a kinsman, Boaz. Parental guidance is advised today as some might blush at where our imaginations take us with Naomi, I mean with Ruth and Boaz on the threshing floor, spooning, or maybe more. Original hearers of this story would have linked it to other stories in their cultural library of potentially scandalous rendezvous, 
like the one now featured in Genesis 19, where Lot's daughters seek him out after he is drunk and lie with him so that they might have children. In their desperation for security, they lie with their father in order to find a way to f have children, to have security. We know how vulnerable a widow is, especially in this scriptural context. Even in our context today, one without a close male kinsman is vulnerable. There's another story that would have come to mind as the original hearers took this story of Naomi and Ruth and Boaz in, as they imagined Ruth and Boaz on the threshing floor, they might have thought of uh, a story that's now featured in Genesis 38, where Tamar disguises herself as a prostitute and goes at night to hook up with her father-in-law, Judah, another prominent man who takes the bait. Tamar also is desperate to have children. Her husband has died. Her husbands have died. And she is seeking security, even if it means lying with her father-in-law. Now, Ruth's ancestry includes the people of Moab, who are the people that came out of the coupling of Lot and his daughters. And Boaz's ancestry is linked to the person Perez, who came out of the coupling of Judah and Tamar. Ha! Perhaps this is a match made in heaven on the threshing floor. Yes, among the many genres of our Bible, we feature also the soap opera. A question for us to carry, though, is, is this story a scandal? Or is it grace? Indeed, the threshing floor was sometimes associated with sex for hire. Men would stay out next to their heaps of grain to defend them, and it was a place where people might come by and, and sell themselves for a, little, for a little bonus. But threshing floor imagery is much richer than just that. The threshing floor is a place where large quantities of grain would be processed, where the kernels of grain would then be winnowed in the wind and the shaft would be separated from them and just a sense of bounty at that spot. These were, well, you saw on G-Day's pictures what these places might look like, so I can skip some of this. But the point I want to make is that the threshing floor was an image for quantities of grain, for abundance, for God's provision. And yes, Laborers might stay on the threshing floor to protect their grain, but also families sometimes would stay nearby and they'd have parties. It would be like festival time because the harvest was in and God had provided again and the mood would be good. All that seed uncovered, all that useless shaft blown away and sometimes burned. No coincidence, I think, that David, King David, would later choose a threshing floor as the site for his altar to Yahweh God. He would buy this threshing floor, par this parcel of land that included a threshing floor, and there he would build his altar. I think because it was such a shimmering place, such, a, such an image of abundance and God's provision. And on that site where David built the altar, David's son Solomon later built the temple. The temple was built on the site of a threshing floor. a place where the nourishing grain and useless chaff, so to speak, of our lives might be separated, a place where God would woo God's people with God's chesed love. All this just to say, wow, a threshing floor. What a cool place for Ruth to pop the question. Boaz, will you marry me? We may, not have, we may not have heard those words exactly in the reading today, but commentators mostly agree that this is how Boaz would have taken it. Supposedly, he wakes up in the middle of the night surprised to find his feet uncovered, feet being a euphemism 
for private parts. Ruth's lying there, ready to make her request. She says, spread your cloak over me. And culturally for them, that was like saying, hey, I've been thinking about it. <laughs> Will you marry me? In their cultural paradigm, the notion of spreading one's wing or one's cloak over another is connected with the idea of pledging oneself in covenant with the other, in hesed love with the other. If you're now engaged or married or if you have been married, I wondered about your proposal story where you met with the vulnerability of such a question. Will you marry me? where you met with the risk of that and the potential promise of that. At this point in the story, it appears that Ruth has already been caught by Boaz's eye. He's been impressed that she's a hard worker, not that that's enough to find security then or now. He's been kind to her. He's seen to it that extra sheaves were left handy for her to glean from. He's provided her fresh water and and supper and a doggy bag to bring home to her mother-in-law, Naomi. But the barley harvest is coming to an end now, and Ruth will have to find some other way to survive, some other way to support her mother-in-law, perhaps. She, like so many women in similar circumstances, is in desperate need of real security. And so she puts herself out there, vulnerable, in need, but also with herself to give in the exchange. What do you say, Boaz? Spread your cloak over me. She might gain everything or lose everything over the course of that moment. It's especially rich, I think, that she brings it on the threshing floor. Pastor DJ turned me on to a TED Talk, which you can Google if you want to see the whole thing, a TED Talk um, by Amanda Palmer. Who watches TED Talks on occasion? Yeah, I recommend it. There's a lot of good stuff there. Amanda Palmer gives this TED Talk entitled The Art of Asking. She talks about how early in her music career, she's a musician, she had to supplement her band income with something more. Like Ruth, like Naomi, she needed to eat. So she created a character she called the eight-foot statue bride. And she'd dress up as a bride and she'd go to a nearby public part, park. She'd put out a milk carton, stand on the milk carton as a bride. She'd bring with her some cut flowers and a can for donations. And there in the stillness, she would wait. And on occasion, people would come by and some would even have the nerve to come up to her to leave her a donation in her can. And when that happened, she broke her statue stillness, extended a flower for the donor to receive. She extended the flower and eye contact. And when someone would receive the flower, which didn't always happen, but when it was received, there'd be this moment in the eye contact. When Amanda would hear without words, she would, she would hear, I like being seen. She'd be saying, Amanda would be saying without words, thank you, I see you. And she'd receive without words, she would hear the people say, thank you, I'm glad to be seen, I see you too. Also sometimes, people would come through the park or drive by the park and they would harass this statue bride, this Amanda Palmer. They would honk at her, they would say deriding things like, get a job, as if she should be ashamed of what she was doing. And she wondered when she was harassed if it was fair, if it was a legitimate offering in the world to be out there to receive money in exchange for a flower and some eye contact. And she decided that it was fair, that there was a real exchange going on. She was giving an experience, she was giving her attention, she was giving her blessing, her eye contact, her gratitude, her flower. She decided 
it was fair. I think that milk crate was maybe like her threshing floor, where she could let the shaft of shame fall away. There's no shame in needing some level of security. We all do. And none of us can fully provide for ourselves. There's no shame, Amanda Palmer would say, in asking. And there's no shame in offering what you have to offer. But asking and offering does make us vulnerable, she acknowledged. Of course, there's always the possibility of abuse when we ask and offer. The potential is there to abuse the other, taking unfair advantage, and surely this happens all the time. But the potential is also there to abuse oneself, to undervalue oneself, to allow oneself to take on a shame that isn't necessary, perhaps. I have this image of of Adam and Eve in their shame and their nakedness in the garden. But if God wanted them to live in shame, she wouldn't have made clothes for them and wrapped them in clothes before showing them their way out. There's no shame in asking and in offering. Eventually, Amanda made enough money with her band that she didn't need to keep working as a statue bride. She, took, she didn't want to lose, though, the connection that she was having out there in the park with those donors who sometimes engaged her. So she brought this approach to connecting with her audience, the equivalent of eye contact that she was after. She brought it to Twitter, and she would tweet requests for a place to stay for the night for her and her band. And she would tweet a request for a piano to practice on. And she'd Twitter, uh, use Twitter for, to request where she might get a meal for the band that night. And her people responded. They knew her well enough, and they accepted her invitation for her to know them better as she went. Eventually, frustrated with her label, her music label, Amanda Palmer took to Kickstarter online. You're familiar with Kickstarter? A way to raise money online, invite people to help you into uh, what you're, what's burgeoning in your life, often in exchange for some little piece of product or relationship. Amanda used Kickstarter and she raised $1.2 million from her fans. And that freed her to give her music away through the internet. Mutual risk-taking leads to mutual gifting and mutual blessing. She's creating a kind of right relationships with her fans and right relationships are mutually redemptive. She even took it so far. Well, should I say? <laughs> Amanda says that couch surfing is like crowd surfing. And she even took her crowd surfing so far that at one intimate gathering, she disrobed and she invited her audience to draw on her. Scandal? Or grace. At this point in the story, like grains getting threshed out and uncovered, perhaps Ruth and Boaz are both vulnerable on that threshing floor. Ruth is risking her welcome and maybe the favor she's found thus far and maybe life with a man considerably older than her. She doesn't know him all that well. Boaz maybe is risking his reputation, risking rumors that they've, they've been seen on the threshing floor that night. He was, after all, a prominent rich man, and she a suspicious foreigner. There was a great deal of social disparity between them. And yet Boaz is impressed with Ruth's loyalty, the Hesed loving kindness she's th shown to Naomi, and I'm guessing he would enjoy that in his life as well. Should he marry Ruth, Ruth and Naomi's security would be established, but he too would be receiving. He seems to admire Ruth's chutzpah in making the move from Moab in taking on a new family, a new God in Bethlehem. It sounds like he was honored to find favor in her sight as well. 
He may even have had this fantasy himself that he'd like to take her for his wife. And he may have known somehow that there was another kinsman in this Leverite marriage option in the Levitical law, that there was another kinsman that maybe would have first dibs for this opportunity. And so even with that, Boaz appears to choose to act in right relationship. He will talk with this other kinsman, and Ruth will be secure either way. It seems he's seen Ruth, despite their social disparity between them, it seems he's seen her humanness on a par with his own humanness. In the morning, I'll find out what I can do, he assures her. And he'll do it quickly. DJ shared one of the meanings for Boaz's name is strength, and another in the Hebrew is swiftness, fleetness. He will not sit on this opportunity. He will act quickly on it. And before Ruth departs in secret, Boaz fills her cloak with barley once again. Now, Boaz wished Ruth well when they first encountered each other back in chapter 2. He said of her, to her, he said, May you have a full reward from the Lord, the God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. Seeing her come in her vulnerability from this land of Moab, risking everything as she came to Bethlehem with her hesed love for Naomi, he sees that and he wishes the best for her, God's blessing. But now is he willing also to serve as an agent of that blessing, as an agent of God's refuge? spreading his wings over her, as symbolized by his cloak. This story reminds us that we have a role to play in making our pious dreams for each other come true. Will Boaz jump in as one through whom God's intended response to human need might be met? Tune in to chapter 4 and find out. There are too many in need of basic security in our world, and perhaps even in this room today. People short of food, people short of decent shelter, decent water, decent friendships. People are short of peace in their homeland, peace in their cities, peace in their minds and in their spirits. Are we not all? in desperate need sometimes. Maybe we can learn a little about the art of asking and offering and even responding with swiftness. Can you think of a time when you came to someone in need, vulnerable to their power? Can you think of a time when someone showed up in need before you, vulnerable to your power. When vulnerability is met with tenderness, with right relationship, with humans on par with each other, without shame, but with grace, doesn't everybody win? One last cool thing about the threshing floor is that in Hebraic law, it was prohibited to muzzle animals there. So if you were an ox or a donkey or whatever who'd, been, who'd arrived at the threshing floor to help trample out the grains or, or to pull the threshing sledges across them, you were not muzzled. You were free to eat. With all that grain falling, they were not allowed to muzzle the animals. They were free to eat, and I love that. The grain uncovered on the floor, the feet uncovered, the dream uncovered, the vision uncovered for the meeting of all our needs, abundance provided through right relationship with God and with each other. The threshing floor, it could be on a milk crate at a bar or a coffee house. It could be on Kickstarter. It could be before the altar at a church, it could be any place really, where the grain loses its 
protection of the shaft, and the very real stands before the very real, vulnerable yet poised for new life. No muzzling allowed, appetites allowed, need allowed, gifts exchanged by God's provision, even by God's scandalous grace. May it be so for us and all. Amen.